I'm really excited to welcome you to the second edition of Advanced Therapies Connect. If this were normal times, uh, we would be in Miami at Advanced Therapies Week. Unfortunately, we cannot all be together in person, but the purpose of this two-day event is to keep you connected with your community. This event is a chance for you to build your personal or company brand whilst keeping up to date with industry trends. We hope you find many connections and take away practical business advice to help you in your day to day. We had an overwhelming amount of advocate, uh, people advocating the event on social media. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, we ran a competition for all of those that advocated the event and our winner is Jenk Freeman from Stenson Therapeutics. Um, six members of his network will be joining us over the next few days. Congratulations, Jenk. We'll send you a £50 Amazon voucher later today. Finally, I would like to introduce you to your host for the next two days, David McKellen. Sorry, David. David is a journalist and broadcaster uh, specialising in technology, telecoms and consumer affairs. David, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Kim. Hello, everyone. Um, as Kim said, my name is David McClelland. I'm a journalist and broadcaster, and it is a real pleasure to be with you all here today and tomorrow for Advanced Therapies Connect, where I know Kim and all the team behind the scenes have been putting together a really busy agenda that I know you'll all get an awful lot from. Just a few bits of housekeeping before we kick off with today's event proper. Um, as I hope you saw on the event agenda, we have three tracks of content prepared for you today. The watch track is where all of the live sessions and panel discussions will take place. This is your destination to watch today. Speakers, leave comments and participate in Q&As. But for those of you who are here perhaps to interact more directly and to make connections, then the network track sessions are all taking place over Zoom. Just to think, Zoom, barely anybody had heard of it this time last year. <laughs> anyway, all of those network events are taking place over Zoom and there are some fantastic topics to discuss and guests to connect with over there. Last but by no means least, the Get Involved track will feature closed door roundtables and discussions where you can participate very actively. So th this is important uh, for those they're only available to a limited number of people. They're kind of intimate uh, events, conversations, uh, more direct interactions with each other. So um, if you would like to join those, just add any of those roundtables to your schedule on this platform and the Facilitate team will confirm your spot. So I think that should be about enough on the announcements for now. Let's jump straight into our first session of the day. And what we've got for you is a fireside chat with Dendrium on how they kept patients safe and collection centres running during COVID-19. And in this session, Melissa Seabock from American Red Cross will be interviewing Melinda Cantabriano from Dendrium. Melinda Cantabriano joined Dendrian in 2017 as Director of Apheresis Operations, overseeing Dendrian's expansive apheresis collection network <coughs> throughout the United States. She ensures patients have convenient access to cell collection in their communities to facilitate their cancer treatment. Melinda is also partnering with Dendrian's colleagues in China to help grow their apheresis network and bring Dendrian's life-extending cancer treatment to Asia for men suffering from prostate cancer. Melissa Seabock is a senior director in product management at the American Red Cross. Her product portfolio includes cell and gene therapy solutions, which encompasses services provided to biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies in support of their development and commercialization of cellular therapies. So, Melinda and Melissa, over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Fireside Chat at Advanced Therapies Connect. As David said, my name is Melissa Seabach and I'm a Senior Director in the Product Management Team at the American Red Cross. And my product portfolio includes cell and gene therapy solutions in which the Red Cross offers autologous and allogeneic mononuclear cell collection services for further manufacture into cell and gene therapies. I've been with the Red Cross for over 16 years, and I've been involved in our provision of mononuclear cell collection services since 2010, when the Red Cross launched Lupapheresis services across the country to support Dendrion Pharmaceuticals' launch of Provenge. And the Red Cross currently performs thousands of collection procedures each year at over 60 Red Cross sites throughout the country in support of the manufacture of Provenge. 
As we all know, the manufacture and delivery of cell and gene therapies can be challenging in the best of times. And the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly created additional challenges for these processes. During today's fireside chat, I'll be speaking with Melinda Caltabiano, Director of Apheresis Operations at Dendrion. Melinda will share with us Dendrion's experience during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the challenges that Dendrion has faced during this time, how they dealt with these challenges, what lessons they've learned, and thoughts for 2021. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Melinda Caltabiano to the chat. Hi, Melinda, and welcome. Hi, Melissa. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to chat with you as we chat so often, and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to connect with um, everyone around the world since we can't be in Miami. Great. So just logistical issue during today's fireside chat, I have several questions that I'll be posing to Melinda, and we would like to ask the audience to hold any questions that they might have to the coffee discussion, which will be occurring immediately following conclusion of a fireside chat. So to kick us off, our first question is, Melinda, could you share with us at an overall level, what has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to your organization? Sure. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I know we've had a lot of conversations about this and, and really everyone as they reflect on 2020 and what a year it was and going into 2021 and where we are. Um, you know, as you can imagine, we are trying to help patients who are being treated for late stage prostate cancer um, and part of our uh, proprietary process with Dendrion and our patients is that they need to go and have their cells collected at mm -hmm. places like American Red Cross. Um, community blood centers and their communities. And um, I think that the impact to our organization looking past you know, a year later is that um, while as much as we are prepared day to day to handle what comes in, you know, nobody was prepared for, for COVID. And we certainly saw across the country as COVID really spread across the country, we saw different impacts in different communities. Um, you know, I think that Originally, a year ago, and we were talking about this, the, you know, we thought, you know, it wasn't going to last, certainly as long as it has. And, you know, we were preparing for an impact all across the country, and we didn't see it at the same time in the same place. So, you know, as as COVID spread, obviously, the challenges spread across the country as well. Um, you know, our patients needed to get their treatment for cancer. And so, together with our partners, we worked to mitigate any potential risk um, that they may experience out in the community or um, along the way. So, you know, we certainly saw in certain communities as COVID spread slowdowns in certain areas. Um, we certainly saw that, um, you know, coming together with our partners in the way that we had to and the way that we did made our partnership stronger. And, you know, we certainly er identified areas of improvement. You know, we're not through the woods yet. And we're still mm -hmm. in the thick of it, as most of you are. Um, so, you know, reflecting upon 2020 and coming into 2021, um, we know that there's areas where um, we need to get ahead of things, where we may not have been able to do that because we just didn't know what was ahead of us. So mm -hmm. all in all, I think, like many of you, our organization is more resilient. Our organization is more prepared. And ultimately, we know that we have a strong network of partners that are right there with us. So, mm -hmm. um, but I would love to turn that question to you as well, <laughs> because I know we've been through this together and um, we've really many times followed your lead as you were dealing with these situations because you are really the front facing organization that, that works with our patients. So how did it impact you overall? Yeah, so we definitely have seen a decrease in the volume of collection procedures. Um, and actually it's been both on the autologous side as well as the allogeneic side. Um, and it has also been sort of across commercial collections and collections in support of clinical trials. Um, recently we have begun to see um, procedure volumes increase, which is great. And we'll talk a little bit later in the discussion today about sort of measures that the Red Cross put in place at our sites very early on to help mitigate the risk to patients and staff and everyone coming to our sites. Um, so I think that that's been really key in allowing folks to feel comfortable coming to our sites. Um, Melinda, could you share what bottlenecks or challenges you envisioned early on and what measures Dendrion put in place to address those? 
Great question. Um, you know, I think that the bottlenecks and the challenges early on, I, I can't say that any of us anticipated what we really saw. Um, I know that a year ago, you know, in February, uh, I was at a conference with a lot of our partners and um, one of the partners said to us, well, what are you doing about COVID? We were actually just chatting about this yesterday. Um, and, and I sort of looked at them and I said, well, what are you doing about COVID? Like, not knowing what to expect. Um, and, you know, it was from that point of, you know, how do we handle this and as it comes to us? So the bottlenecks, um, you know, obviously we had to ensure that our patients were able to continue to receive selections at our partner sites. So um, just anticipating, you know, making sure that our partners were prepared, our partners had a plan, um, and then, you know, our products need to, we have a very short turnaround time um, when our, after our patients, uh, the cells are collected and they are, the products are returned to our manufacturing facilities for processing and we use commercial airlines. Um, I would say we did not anticipate the bottleneck that happened around the total uh shut not shut down but almost shut down of commercial airlines and the frequency mm -hmm. of, of airlines and getting our products back to our manufacturing facility so i would like to say we anticipated that but i don't think anybody anticipated that um, so there was a lot of scrambling logistically to ensure that the products that our partners were collecting were able to get to our manufacturing facility and then back to the physician for the patient's right. treatment um, so you know, not so much a bottleneck, but really, you know, a, a real problem in not just for us, but for so many um, as the airlines just really, really scaled back on availability mm -hmm. and frequency of flights. Um, so, you know, really that was a, you know, couldn't anticipate because you didn't know what the airlines were going to do and how logistics were going to be. So it's really more um, not so much anticipating as much as, you know, triaging and troubleshooting day to day. And as much as you would get good at that and, you know, figure it out during that week or that month, then it would change. Um, right. And I know you, you saw that as well. Um, so while we did anticipate that there would be, you know, mitigations at our collection partner sites, right, there would be procedures to ensure patient safety. Um, I don't think that we anticipated the problems, the other problems logistically with some of our patients who needed to, many of our patients um, live close to state borders and they would receive their collections in other states. So we certainly mm -hmm. didn't anticipate that states would close their borders and that patients would need to travel across borders to patients and employees in certain situations would need to travel and, you know, we'd have to make sure that they were able to go and receive their treatment. Um, so as much as I'd like to say we were able to anticipate all of the potential challenges, I really do feel like much more of it was about, you know, um, triaging and mitigating the challenges as they came, which we did very well um, mm -hmm. and ensured that our patients, all of those patients that were scheduled to be collected and treated were treated um, but it was, it was a challenge throughout the year. Um, and, and again, I'll turn that question to you as well. I mean, I know we sort of worked through it together, the challenges that came up, but right. how did American Red Cross anticipate what was next with COVID? Yeah. So I have to say the immediate challenge that we identified early on, and I, I know that we've talked about this too, in terms of how quickly this all happened, but very early on, we identified the need to keep our collection sites open and operating while protecting our donors, patients, staff, and all of the visitors to our sites. Um, so we were really proactive in putting in place several measures to help ensure safety at our sites. Um, these measures have evolved over the last several months. Um, so the measures that have been put in place include a temperature screening for everyone entering a Red Cross site. And if their temperature is above 99.5 degrees, they are not permitted to enter. Uh, we also implemented stop signs to alert potential donors and patients presenting for collection of any situations for which they should defer donation that day. Um, implementation of pre-appointment phone calls to pre-screen patients and research subjects prior to their appointment. Uh, we also implemented pre-read material to allow patients and research subjects to self-defer as well. Uh, we implemented a mask requirement for everyone on site at a Red Cross facility, and we implemented enhanced cleaning and disinfecting procedures as well. Uh, we also implemented social distancing 
And at many of the sites where we perform leukophoresis for further manufacture, we actually have a private room for these collections. And that can consist of between one to four beds. And in those areas, it was very easy to kind of implement social distancing because we could just move to serial collection procedures instead of concurrent. Um, and then finally, we also created and implemented an exposure matrix. Um, and this allows us to have a consistent approach to evaluating staff risk and any subsequent quarantining necessary. So in addition to putting these measures in place um, to keep everyone coming on site at a Red Cross facility safe, we also recognize the need to communicate measures to our biotech and pharma company clients, uh, to the prescribing physicians who send patients to our sites, um, as well as to the patients themselves. And these communication efforts took place just as soon as our plan um, to put these measures in place went into effect. So we were really proactive and make, about making sure that we you know, communicated to you, the prescribing physicians and to the patients as well. Wow, that's it's impressive because I, I, you know, as much as we knew, we knew that there was so much behind the scenes with our partners and the patients and, you know, trying to, you know, it was, I will say that I think we anticipated the impact to be larger than it actually was. And and mm -hmm. I will say that's probably testament to everything you just talked about and how you ensured keeping the patient safe. So a question that we actually hadn't planned, but now, uh, you know, I bring it up. So how, how did the patients, um, how did they appear to you? I mean, we really heard very little from our patients as far as, you know, of course there were patients who were worried about going out at all, um, but, but not as much as we expected. Um, but we don't, you know, you are our front facing partner working with the patients. So how, how were the patients when they came for their collections? And was it just sort of business as usual once you put all these measures in place? Yeah, I think it was. And I do think, you know, folks that were just really uncomfortable coming out in public during this period, you know, just have not come, period. But the people that, you know, kind of understand the measures that have been put in place and are comfortable coming will come for leukophoresis. So I think in terms of the patients, once they arrive and, you know, they see the additional measures that are put in place, you know, they do feel comfortable. And I have to say too, Melinda, the uh, feedback we got from our clients, as well as the prescribing physicians and the patients was so wonderful. They were really appreciative of the measures that were put in place. Um, and I think that communication was just really key. Yeah, um, I, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for all you did. Ah, <laughs> you're welcome. And thank you for being such a good partner. I was actually just recalling about how all of this happened and how quickly it happened. I know we talked a little bit about that too, but you know, it started on like a Monday, Tuesday, the planning, and we were on the phone on Wednesday talking about the plans that would be put in place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Melinda, given Dendron's experience over the last several months, what learnings has your organization taken away from the pandemic? Wow. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, just as you mentioned, the power of partnership. Um, it's, you know, obviously we knew we had strong partners in the community that were working to help our patients, but, you know, it, partnership within our organization as well. You know, nobody, we could not have gotten through this, just our organization. We depended on so many people, obviously our patients, but our partners that were taking care of our patients, but internally as well. Um, so many people had to work together that may not have worked together previously to make sure not only that our patients were safe and getting collected in the community, but that our employees were safe, um, as many of you, right? So it wasn't just mm -hmm. about what you were doing in the community to, see, to treat patients, but, you know, you had to make sure that our employees in our manufacturing facilities could, could get to work could be healthy and mitigate, you know, minimize the risk to them and ensuring that other employees, you know, minimizing the number of people that were in, in the, you know, plant at the same time so that you could reduce the potential risk of exposure or of those employees, essential workers becoming ill or exposed. Right. So it's, you know, the, I think we knew we had a great team to start with overall, and that, that's internal, external, but, you know, looking back on it, I think, Many of us were just really impressed at um, how well everyone worked together, despite the circumstances and the challenges that came day to day. And mm -hmm. everyone is so committed to continuing 
you know, day-to-day work, right? Just like, yes, it's there and we're going to handle it and we're going to handle it as it comes up. And we're going to work with our partners to make sure that our patients are safe, but also, you know, that our employees are safe. Mm -hmm. And how about you? What did you, uh, what did you learn? Yeah. So I definitely think the power of partnerships is absolutely key. Um, Within Red Cross to Cell and Gene Therapy Solutions Group, I think we have two additional learnings. One that you kind of touched on in terms of cross-functional collaboration. Um, And so when we started to work on what measures we would put in place to help mitigate the risk of COVID at our sites, um, we created a cross-functional team right away of all the key stakeholders to develop this robust response. And we had folks in that team from medical office, from quality and regulatory product, process, execution, account management. And I really believe that this cross-representation allowed the response that we developed to be robust and make sure that we had the perspectives of all of the relevant stakeholders included in that response. Um, The second key learning I would say is the importance of communication. And I know I touched on this a little bit earlier, but. As soon as the plan that we had developed was complete um, in terms of the measures that we would be putting in place, we worked quickly to communicate this to multiple impacted constituents. Um, And this did include internal communication to our staff of these measures would be impacting them, as well as external communication to our clients. And as I mentioned, you know, I really feel that that was very key in getting our clients comfortable the prescribing physicians comfortable, and then the patients comfortable as well. So those are the two key key learnings I would say that we took away. Yeah, I I would agree. I mean, the communication and, you know, not only our communication with you, but with our partners, but, um, and and you mentioned that, you know, getting ahead of it and the, the communication to the prescribing physicians and really you made it very, very clear that you were on top of this and, you know, you were had a plan in place. And that was very, very helpful for us. Um, and that really gave us a level of comfort and, mm-hmm. you know, that things weren't going to completely slow down or stop for our patients. And so that was, you know, as you know, um, our organization does reminder calls to our patients so that, you know, they can go and for their appointments. Um, and it was really, really helpful to let the patients know what to expect, but you do that as well. And you reach Mm -hmm. out to the patients and make sure that they were aware. Um, So not only the communication with us, but with the patients, I think was really critical so that, you know, it's, uh, of course they're, they have cancer and they're nervous and, and they have to go and receive treatment and they many times don't know what to expect. Um, But that communication to them that you were making sure that they would stay safe and that they would be safe um, during their collection was really, really key. And, and I think if you remember, you know, in the early day, you know, in the early days of COVID, um, you know, now everybody wears masks all the time for the most part, at least, you know, where I am. Um, and that was not really typical. You know, I think that yeah. in our collection, in our collection rooms, I don't think that was normal that um, you would, I think that would almost make patients more nervous if people had masks on. Mm-hmm. So, um, but we uh, ensured, you know, we, we send a, a patient uh, care kit and uh, included masks in that. But I know that um, you guys jumped on that as well, just as an extra level of security and safety. And, you know, from the beginning, just to ensure that that level of comfort for the patients was there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that was one of the measures that I missed when I was going through the list. Absolutely. Everyone going to a Red Cross site, staff, patients, visitors, everyone wears a mask now. Yeah, definitely. yeah and we, we take that for granted that that seems so normal now, but that really wasn't in the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Melinda, with the availability of the COVID vaccines now and the start out of the start of the rollout of these vaccines across the country, what are your thoughts for 2021? Well, well, I'd say my first thought is um, there's been a lot of discussion about the vaccine. And as we're sort of coming to the end of January, um, I think there's still a lot of questions about the vaccine. And, you know, obviously our our patients are um, high risk and um, it's state by state, as you know, in the United States and the rollout has been um, challenging, I think, in some areas. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, you know, any learnings going into 2021, we feel so much better prepared 
um, at this point, knowing the power of our partnerships and knowing that we are resilient and that we will overcome anything we can to treat our patients. Um, so I think that the vaccine, obviously we want to ensure that all of our employees are vaccinated and that all of our patients can have access to vaccination. But as you know, and as we've discussed, um, it's not that seamless yet, but our hope is that, you know, more and more patients in the states where they live and the communities where they are, that they're able to receive the vaccination mm -hmm. um, to give them that additional level of comfort as well as, you know, obviously our employees. But um, as you know, and probably most people know wherever they are, that the rollout has been still a little bit challenging and slow. So right. um, and we had this conversation yesterday, but um, going into 2021 for you, um, how has that been? How's the impact with your with your team, with your staff, with your sites? Yeah, so I definitely feel that the Red Cross has a very good process in place now regarding the measures, and those are tweaked as necessary. Um, so I think that that's you know very strong. Um, we are really encouraged by the approval and the rollout of the vaccines, and we do believe too that you know the patients that are uh, receiving Provent are probably going to be early on in terms of receiving the vaccines, and so we do think that there will be you know increased utilization. Uh, in the near term, even even over the next few months. So, you know, we're very encouraged and we anticipate that volumes are going to increase, you know, both on the autologous side, as well as allogeneic uh, for commercial therapies, as well as as well as enrollment in clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we we've seen that um, we have seen, you know, we've heard that our patients are because many of them are older as well. So, um, you know, depending on where they are, we've definitely seen you know, many of them have started to, you know, mention, I think, you know, when they're in for their collection that they've either gotten the first dose or um, will be getting the, the first dose. So um, I think it's just hopefully a little added layer of um, comfort, you know, as we go into this year where we're still challenged with many of the things we were challenged with last year. But um, we have a, a really resilient team um, that works well together. And we know that we have amazing partners that are, are working with us on our behalf as well. So very happy about that. Thanks, Melinda. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights and for the conversation. And thanks to everyone for joining the Fireside Chat. We definitely would welcome any Q&A and ask folks to join us in the coffee discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. This has thanks. been, uh, I feel like we're just scratching the surface. So please join us in the coffee and we'll chat more. Great, thank you. Grand. So, um, listen, uh, thank you very much indeed, Melinda and Melissa. And just like you said, in these challenging times, it's all about the power of partnerships. And I think many of us have found that to be very true this past year. Um, speaking of challenges, apologies to anybody who experienced a mix up with the session codes just now. For all future sessions, the session codes will be in the session discussion if you need them. Uh, up next on the network track, Join the coffee break session with Melinda and Melissa uh, further. Then join us back here uh, for a panel discussion on scaling up for large and patient populations. And over on the Get Involved track, we'll have a roundtable dealing with securing investment in China. Lots to see, lots to engage with. Hope to see you back here soon. <laughs>